Raffaele Marcello in the Mercedes on pole position. Patrick Niederhauser in the blue Audi lines up alongside. The lights will go green to get the race underway any second now. And a really good getaway by Marcello, who's about three lengths clear of everybody else on the run up towards Panic. He called them napping. That was a demon start. And Niederhauser did a good job to get that Audi. And look at the Ferrari almost four wins off the track. Up towards Drew is there, Marcello getting away. There on the outside line is the Ferrari. Pierre Alexander Jean goes wide, wide, wide into Drew is. Jim Plant nips up the inside and gets ahead of him. And now look at the Ferrari. The white Ferrari on the inside goes up to try to gain a place. And Van Thor runs Hazer out wide as they come through Graham Hill Bank for the first time. And drama there. Around has gone the number 18 Lamborghini. That is Gerhard Terraza. And he had a bit of help in that. Yes, I know. It's the nose of the Hardy up against the door of the Lamborghini. But here we are following. So this is on board Jimmy Plough looking at the back. The 3200 gets me there. So that Nita Hajo consolidating that second place. Whoops, sideways Porsches very nearly getting together there. The Porsche's got a puncture, I think the right yeah. here has been cut down, got the contact somewhere. That's why the, everybody's stacked up coming through all doors. Right, look back there, you can see there the Jim Plough Mercedes, which is running what, fourth place, good getaway. But Raffaele Marcello has checked out. Look at this, he's on his own. He's nearly in the next round of the championship. Niederhauser is second, third is Van Thorpe, fourth is Pla, and then in fifth place is Hauser as they come up towards the line. The dramas for a number of teams on that opening lap, but Marcello's gap is obscene. Well, he comes across the line way clear. I mean, I don't know whether he jumped the start or whether he just anticipated it better than anybody else, but he left the rest of the field, literally, as you say, standing, and has now got a very comfortable the opening lap second advantage. Now there's a replay of the start. Uh, again, Marcello has just been so good. Two or three lengths clear as he got to the line. Everybody else having to scrap over second place. But Marcello's first lap on cold tyres, impressive. Yeah, well, the light literally went out and he was hard on and, and the field behind seemed to be just hesitant in getting as quickly or reacting as quickly as we saw from Marcello. Now that advantage that he got on this opening, look, you can see already he's got maybe half a second of an advantage of Adina Hauser as the rest of the field is all the way down to the paddock event. Here's a few back from the that saw Dardy. The Ferrari is trying to get in, is trying to get in, but there's no way for it to go. The Ferrari is holding it out, and that was part of what caused the Ferrari to some of the ground. Look how wide it gets at the edge of the paddock event. On board with Chris Froggett. Stacked up behind him, but he's resisting all of that pressure very nicely. Is that Mercedes noisier than any other Mercedes, or is just where the microphone on the cockpit is based? It does sound noisy, you're right. Might be where the microphone is, but he was making a funny noise yesterday, that's for sure. It is loud. Chris Frog again just gets away because Neubauer has to go uh, on the attack, and Umbrescu on the defensive, coming up towards the line. And actually, this is Neubauer's best chance yet, but he's committed to the outside line, he needs the undercut. Yeah, and I thought Dean McDonald was going to try and slot the McLaren in, get his nose into the inside as they come up. They love the inside. Well, that is going to be... He's made it work. How there wasn't contact between those two cars. Good driving on the part of Umberescu to avoid that. And you can see with the <laughs> AWR team, they give it an applause. And Van Ford just about now is close enough to think about making a move, but to do it, he's got to be brave. Where would you do it? Do you think, OK, I'll do it down into clearways, but the gap is remaining constant all the way down the short straight into clearways. Next place, going to be up into Paddock Hill Bend. Good exit from Dries Van Thor. He's got the momentum now, but again, Niederhauser's going to hug the inside of the racetrack, forcing Van Thor the long way around, and he can only go so far at the entry of Paddock Hill Bend before he's going to get out of it. Niederhauser's consolidated. Now Van Thor's going to think about going up the inside into Cruz, but again, coming off. He's determined to strike, isn't he, as they come now through the corner. A little clip of the curve by Niederhauser. The car twitches slightly, but Van Thor not able to take advantage of that. Downhill, Graham Hill Bend, go left. Run wide over the curb on the outside. The two Audis skip back onto the circuit. The margin between them at the start of the lap. Point one, four, six of a second. Go left onto the Grand Prix loop. They could not be closer. Neubauer gets past Froggart, gains another place, goes through, goes 19th. Cars into the pit lane already. Absolutely. So it's one or two of the Silver Cup or Pro Am entries, but it's Niederhauser as well that comes in. So Patrick Niederhauser and also Jim Pla come in early. Now that's interesting, Niederhauser in as soon as possible to give way to Aurelian Panis. That surprises me. Jim Pla for Goon on is rather more obvious.
and just looking at this, the 88 Mercedes has got ahead of the Santa Lock Audi. So on the pit stops, Jules Gounon there, look, will come out ahead of Aurelien Panis. So that's what I was saying about WRT. They, they could certainly jump Santa Lock on the pit stops because the ASP Mercedes has done exactly that. Now, the stop from 88 was 43 and a half seconds, and from Santa Lock, 52.3. That's a dreadful stop. That's terrible. I mean, you, you just you cannot, at this level, give away one second, let alone six seconds. The doctor will see you now. Valentino gets to the door, opens it up, assists Fred Mabish, get out, there we go. Now get the seat belts attached, get the shoulder strap across, get the lap belt attached. That is also incorporating the crutch strap. Fred Mabish, might have been those tight the shoulder straps, Valentino. You can't do it when you're driving down the pit lane. But you see how well drilled that stop was, and the car is waved away. Fred Mabish, he was unhappy because yeah. they lost maybe, a, maybe up to two seconds, but certainly one second by not being quite on the ball, getting the car rolling. And is that the leader in? It is. Raffaele Marciello then arrives with Timo Vagoslavski set to take over. While well, Rossi has caught the GSM Nova Marine Lamborghini, which should get out of the way. And it holds its line, the blue light flashes on the bridge, so Valentino around the outside puts a lap on to Tumblu and goes through. And more importantly, he's now got a car between himself and the pursuing three cars. Again, that's, he got cleanly through at an important part of the racetrack, didn't lose any momentum, and the other three catch up and be partly where they catch. And they are battling amongst themselves, so their focus will be on taking advantage of each other, at the same time not putting themselves in a disadvantage. So there, down towards Hawthorns, goes the second-placed Audi. And Charles Wirtz turns through Hawthorns. There is Jules Gounon hunting him down. This is Gounon's view. Heads towards Westfield now, turns right, rattles the curb. He's creeping up onto the back, the gap 1.6 seconds. But you can sense the frustration from Wirtz because he's on the limit, but he just can't do anything about Bogostowski. He's not even eating into it, the gap's going up. And that is Patrick Krupinski leading still in Pro-Am, but almost undoing Christian Klein's good work there by running way wide at Paddock Hill Bend. But he's back on the racetrack. Oh, it's a big drama there for Jean-Baptiste Simonau at Druid. He's had a, a lose. He gets back into the race, but that's cost him a fair few places. How did he do it? Let's see. Uh, was that on his own, or was there an assist? There was. But no, he's, well, there yes. was an assist indeed. There was. Thomas Druid in the Mercedes clobbered into the rear of the Audi. That is Rossi. He is still in eighth. But behind him is Tom Druet, and we saw how aggressive he can be up at Druids a few laps ago. So Valentino will be looking in his mirrors, keeping an eye on the road ahead. He's got a clear road ahead, so his focus is now very much on the Mercedes running behind, and then Nicholas Schull in the 99 Audi directly behind the Mercedes. So under pressure for a top 10 finish for the 46 Audi here this afternoon. Now this is looking back for Weirds, that is still Jules Gounon. Menacingly close behind, but Jewel is just not quite, quite, quite able to get there behind him. You can catch, and then he gets into that sort of wash, that dirty air from the back of the Audi, and that sort of tattoos out the attack that Gunnar has been planning all the way through. Takes a lot of curve on the inside, coming into Sheen, that gave a marginal advantage to close down the back of the Audi. Wants to get again as close as possible to put the now and the end here to the airways. Of course, they've still got those three back markers to deal with. So there they are, Giorgio Roda goes through ahead of Miguel Ramos, ahead of Hugo Delacour, the leader has picked his way through, but unwittingly these back markers might, might, might change the situation for second place, because if you encounter one at exactly the wrong moment, that might give an opportunity to the car behind, let's see, Gounon is closer than ever before now, Charles Wirtz is going to try and time this absolutely right, Bogoslavski is away and gone up the road though. He's clear, he's got no pressure whatsoever, there is our race leader. And soon to be race winner, Timo Bogoslavski carrying on Rafael Marciello's good work. Here they come after mechanical maladies scuppered potential wins last year. This has been an absolutely perfect day, certainly as far as race two is concerned. The car then now comes down towards clearways of Clark Curve. We're looking back from the Charles Wirtz Audi. We'll come back to it in a moment because, first of all, there's a chequered flag at the ready. There's an Akodis ASP win for Timo Bogoslavski and Rafael Marciello, who win at Brands Hatch. Here is second and third. They're together in the traffic, but Charles Wirtz has just done enough. He is second. Jules Gounon is third. And the margin was 0.273 of a second, but Raffaele Marciello is delighted. 
and Dries van Thorpe has to at least accept second place and the points, which are going to be crucial during the year. And they're finishing in eighth place, Valentino Rossi. And eighth in this company is certainly no disgrace. I think you'd be very, very happy indeed to <laughs> see giving his love to the TV viewers, to the fans around the racetrack. Timo Bogoslavski and Raffaele Marciello win a France hatch from Charles Witz and Dries van Thorpe, which will go on and Jim Parr taking third. Good result for fourth, Timo Gachet and Christopher Hauser ahead of the race one winners, at least Pell and Pierre Alexander Richard. Sixth, Aurelian Panis and Patrick Niederhauser. The second of the Silvers, Tom Adrouet and Casper Stevenson. Uh, ninth, and the third of them, Nicholas Scherl and Alex Arca. Tenth overall. Well, there, Raffaele and Timo Bogoslowski, they receive their trophies, and uh, now there'll be a big smile, I'm sure. And uh, last but not least, Raffaele it is who gets the trophy. And a uh, very happy man he is too. Well, there the celebrations continue as Timo Bogoslowski and uh, Raffaele Marciello can reflect on a great drive. We've had two really interesting races to kick off our Fanatec GT Sprint Cup season. And uh, we look forward to more of the same in two weeks' time from Manny Cruz.